Hi everybody, it's Kate Noella here and I've got a wonderful interview today coming up. It's with my special guest, Sean Kay. I haven't known Sean for long, but he's obviously been around online for some time. He's got a lot of experience and knowledge to bring to the table, I can assure you. Sean actually has two online businesses as his main focus of income, rapidactionwriting.com and rapidactionseo.com. He's also created a new blog recently, which is mainly consisting of a podcast called wsobackstage.com. And he also has his own personal blog, seank.com as well. Now, I could talk to Sean all day and all night. In fact, this interview went for over two hours, which was really quite long, and yet he was still willing to talk more. So he's quite a marathon man to me, and he was very generous with his information and advice and help. And so I'm really glad to sort of give you this interview. I'm going to deliver it in three stages, though, in part one, two, and three. And I'll briefly summarize what's in them in a minute. For every now and again, I would talk to Sean about inadvertently I would talk to him about my product that I've just released the bloggers who podcast for success which really highlights all the benefits of podcasting for people mainly for bloggers especially bloggers like Sean so it's interesting to hear how he's gone with his blogging and podcasting and what he has to say about all that I do have a preview of my course on my site bloggerswhopodcast.com if you sign into there you get sent a preview of that course if you're interested in it because it's not very expensive and it's a it's a great introduction to podcasting for anyone who wants to give podcasting a go as you will hear from sean podcasting is a fantastic way to drive traffic to your site and there's so many ways you can spin your podcast content so when i spoke with sean in part one sean has explained a lot of things about seo inadvertently without me realizing that's what he's doing because i really want to talk to him about his blog but we talked about so much so in part one we talk about seo factors like authority blogging and authority bloggers there's a new term out there called authority rank And he explains all this and how it's relative to bloggers today and helps you get more traffic and why. It's it's just really insightful to know this information in layman's terms. And then I sort of talked to things about affiliates, especially to do with his products. And I, I was also very keen to talk about his return on an investment with his WSO backstage blog. So he shares all those information, all that information with us as well. In part two, the next interview, I'll just summarize basically there. We're also going to talk about the two types of bloggers that are out there and what differentiates the two between them. And then we have a great discussion about a webinar he put out recently, which he sold before people watched it. And then he sold it at the end as well. And then he explains why later why he took it off the market altogether, because I was sort of like, well, why didn't you just keep it going? So it's really insightful to see his opinion on, and well, really, it's really good advice because he's basing all this advice on his own experience kind of really hard to get this good advice so in part two we actually end up talking about building relationships with your tribe or community if it's a podcaster and you know we talk about giving things away free because there's two methods out there at the moment to get subscribers one is that you just ask and hope they sign in and the other is that you give something away free to give them an incentive to sign up And it was really interesting to hear Sean's take on why he suggested not to give freebies away and on what basis you should and when. But, you know, kind of, it was just a fantastic conversation. It really made things a lot clearer in my mind. So I'm sure it will help you that way too. And then in part three, the final part of this interview, we talk about sales funnels. And obviously, Sean has got a lot of experience with this. So it was really exciting to talk to him about how to set up your sales funnel, how to get the people to buy things. He talks about James Schranko's model of the chocolate wheel and how that's all relative to a sales funnel. He then reflects on his own SEO company, rapidactionseo.com, and how they're building affiliate products and the structures. And he's, again, he's basing it all on his own experience, so he's not guessing. Uh, it's really great information. And I really loved the way he summarized his products and how you should create products. The way he summarized his SEO products is he said he wanted to make his clients business easier make their business better and improve their business and then I added on make more money which he was quick to point out well that would be making it better so (laughs) but uh yeah so look and then we end up talking about podcasting as well and of course we talked 
briefly about my product, Bloggers Who Podcasters, again, and, and how that's going. So make sure you come into iTunes, say hello, leave a review. These things always help with SEO for me because we're starting out, or you can go onto my blog, but it's probably easier just to go through iTunes. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon with my next interview I've got coming up is with James Shrenko. So without further ado, here's Sean, and he's talking about his latest new project, wsobackstage.com, his blog or podcast, and how that's all going. So I'm just I'm just trying to think about this. Um, I think you have to think of it a little. So I guess um, when I started doing podcasting in 2005, uh, it was from a technical perspective. All the podcast was literally was an audio file on the extension of the RSS feed. That it was literally all it was to us. So it was an audio blog and a video blog. It's it's all the same. Um, it's just a it's just a different type of content. Yeah, it's still a blog. You're right. You're exactly right. It's just that you. I guess you're doing like sponsored posts as opposed to just blogging about your family traumas and well, things yeah. like that. So you, you're maximizing the potential to make money by making it interesting in content. So there's a difference, right? Like yeah. I think I think the, uh, there's two different markets there, and it's something I kind of came across probably about two years ago. Um, there's people who do there's bloggers, mm. and for them it's about content creation and uh getting their message out and and oftentimes some kind of passion project and then there are people who are online marketers or internet marketers and there are people who are putting together product services and content with the intent of monetizing that content and you end up making a decision for yourself sometimes you're lucky and they fall in both camps but i was gonna ask do how would you apportion that? Let's say there's three camps, one that's only blogging, one that's only monetizing, and then there's a, a category that does both. Do you have an idea how that's dispersed? Surely there'd be most blogging. Yeah, of course. There's lots of people, you know, there's that old saying about, you know, opinions, everybody has one, right? So, and that's what mm. I think blogging is. is it's it's the, I don't know, I suppose the catchphrase is the democratization of publishing industry. Anybody can set up a blog and anybody can be the next Huffington Post if they wanted to. And most people are quite happy to, to share their thoughts on a topic or whatever. But see, there's different types of blogs and there's different types of of approaches. So I have, uh, we own a blog that does gaming, right? So there's video gaming. And we've had that since 2010. There's hundreds and hundreds of original posts, videos, you name it, right? Yeah. And if we probably haven't made $200 off that site in two and a half, three years, I've got a blog that talks about, I, that's about ice hockey. And I've spent, you know, time on that. And I can't make money at that to save my life. Mm -hmm. But something like WSO Backstage, I know about that industry. I know about the products. I know the marketing angle. And for me, it's, you know, uh, it's just a, it's a, uh, it's a, a vehicle to sell people's products. Right. Um, it's an advertising platform and we wrap um, we wrap content around it. So, yeah. you know, the whole... It's, look, it's a good model too, though, because a lot of people, a, a lot of my demographic are, are bloggers who really just blog. They're not really in the monetization very well, or they want to be. Uh, and so this is interesting, like your podcasting approach, because they could insert a podcast like you're doing, like if you want to call it a sponsored post, even though it's not verbatim what it is, within their normal blog. It's like an addition. I don't know if they'd syndicate it to iTunes, but they could certainly put the player, like embed the player in the post. It makes it different. and it, So they could sort of adapt what you're doing in a nice kind of way, I think. Well, well I think it's a matter of which way you look at it. Like I, I look at the podcast, the WSO Backstage podcast, as I see it as an education podcast. We talk about you know, marketing, we talk about how the people like the guests got into marketing, what else they work on the vehicles they use. Mm. So I look at that. So there's two angles to that, right? I look yeah. at the podcast content as educating buyers, not about product, but educating buyers generally. And then the person who's on the show, they look at it from I'm, I'm building up my own credibility, but I'm here to pitch a product probably the best example that i could think of when somebody asked me to describe it, it it's very similar to my vision for it was similar to 
late night talk show in the US, right? Mm -hmm. So you watch Dave Letterman, uh, you watch, you know, 20 years ago, you watch Johnny Carson, and you'll have, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone turn up on on Letterman. And they'll talk about, you know, something to do with Sylvester Stallone, his newest car or, you know, some, whatever, you know, the tragedy that happened to his son and all that stuff. Yeah. And then at the last five minutes, they'll get into he's there to pitch a movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so it's part entertainment, it's part education, and it's part advertising platform. This, this comes down to the, the webinar model to me, where, where you have a webinar where you educate and then really at the end you're sort of doing a call to action. To a degree, yeah. I think it's a it's the webinar model where that has a, a really good uh, spin to it is the live interactivity. So mm. imagine a scenario where you're doing that kind of a show, but at the end of the show, the audience can ask real time questions. And that's what actually makes webinars as successful as they are. So if people do a webinar to sell or pitch a product, the real money is in the fact that it's one, it's an event. So people are mm. turning up in a place in a time, but two, there's a level of interactivity. People who don't field questions during their webinars are missing the boat. They've lost the plot. Um, the webinars that are the least successful webinars are the formulaic ones. So the ones that tease education and then tell you, well, I could have charged you $87, but I'm only going to charge you 27 That formula is not as effective as it used to be. People now anticipate it. So the ones that work well now are really the here's a big event. I'm giving you something. If you like that, I've got something else that you can buy. That's the, oh. that's working well. What was your most recent webinar that you did? Have you done one or? Yeah. So, so interestingly enough, we did a, um, through our SEO business, this was back. We did, we've done a fair few, but back in sort of February, March, when Google was making a lot of changes with, and they just introduced Penguin, but they, in April, but they were doing a lot of changes and things in the time frame. They were de-indexing blog networks, doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff. They were really attacking SEO. And a lot of our customers were like, well, I don't want to do SEO anymore because it looks like it's a waste of money. Well, that's not good for your business if your business is SEO. So <laughs> yeah, so we went to we went out to the people and said, okay, look, we're getting a lot of questions here. Uh, and this is a good sort of product creation idea for probably for your listeners. But we went out to them and said, okay, look, we're going to do a four week webinar series on the fundamentals of SEO. Now, these are the fundamentals of SEO that will never change. These are the things that Google will always like because that's what Google does. Uh -huh. And we said, if you want to attend the four week webinar series, it's $27. Uh -huh. So we, we basically got, I think, probably close to 100 people bought that within just off our list. So it was just pretty quick. And um, did, you, did you then offer money back? Yeah, on we that? just we do we do 30 day money back on anything. We didn't have a single refund. I would never okay. get refunds. Okay. We never get refunds. So so then we sold those. And then we did, you know, the four weeks of webinar series did a fifth week because in the middle of the series, Penguin was introduced. So we did a fifth bonus week. <laughs> Uh, That's awesome. And then, and then at the end, we took that product and we went out and sold it as a five week or a ten hour SEO course. Oh my gosh! Yes, of course. So we repackaged that as. We, How much did you sell that for? Sorry, twenty seven dollars again. Oh, twenty seven again. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it, we took it down after a while, but um, we were actually going to re release it again recently, but. Google's made even more changes so it's sort of like just you have to be careful about how many times you release the same thing over and over again but you know if you can sell a webinar series in advance and then use that content and repackage it as a product after you know we t we did transcripts and everything's I mean there's realistically if we were being clever what we could have done is we could have taken the transcripts and and probably turn that transcript into an ebook on the basics of SEO and then put that up on Kindle or sold that as an ebook on its own or whatever. So, you know, repurposing all that content is pretty straightforward. The other one that you can do with, and you'll pick this up, is you do enough of these interviews and stuff, and you'll eventually be able to go back and get all your MP3s, listen to them, and create a whole book on tips and tactics and tricks that people have. Well, Srini, Srini's done that now from Blogcast right. FM. I don't know if you know, he's released a book called Blogged. Oh, was that called it? blog book or something and learn how they did yeah. it and it's just a collection of his interviews <laughs> oh, 
yeah, and that's that's been uh, a very popular model uh, for people the last couple of years is um, selling uh, interview series with people. Uh, I I'm not a huge fan of selling the interview series themselves. Yeah. I think the 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 value would be for somebody like yourself or whatever to synthesize down all of the really good ideas. I agree. And that's something. probably more like what I want to do, actually. Yeah. I don't think I'd just mass, mass release it. No, no. And it, I don't think anyone would be that interested. Well, it's no. and it's boring. Well, it's old, too. Like, yeah. by the time you actually... Well, you also have to think selfishly, too, that from, from a purely selfish perspective, you're releasing these products, well, one, to make money, but two, to... Uh, uh, build your own credibility and authority. And if, if, if you've done these interviews and learned things from people and you've applied that yourself and so now it's part of your knowledge bank mm. and, and you then turn that into a book, well, it's still your knowledge. You've not, you, you've just learned something and now you're sharing it. So there's no point in attributing that to somebody else. I mean, you can quote people and things, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't basically put an interview there of somebody else doing it. So you you definitely, the other one is as well that I think people who do blogging need to, to sort of step back sometimes is making money is not a bad thing. And sometimes I think people feel dirty or something about selling stuff there, you know, there's the old saying, nothing happens till somebody sells something. It's a, it's a big problem for my demographic because a lot of them, they don't even like to capture emails. They are afraid it's embarrassing them. They don't like pop-ups because that's offensive. They're not really thinking about the big picture of how competitive it is. And, yeah, it's the stigma rather than the strategy that seems to dictate their practices. And as a result, they sort of sit on a gold mine and don't really milk that much, which is a shame. Yeah. Because some internet marketer will come up and sweep them or, you know, <laughs> take their content maybe even, but not even that, just, just, just does it better and yet, the, what the, the real original curator, a writer, whatever you want to call it, misses out, which is a shame. Well, I think it's well, I think it's the 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 model has changed. Like we used to be able to charge for your content, mm-hmm. and that I think those days are gone. I think the days of you know being able to you know create a newspaper and charge people a dollar for it you know that's that's a hard business to get into it's funny you say that because Harold's son have now got that digital pass so to read most of their articles online you actually have to pay their weekly fee so they're going the complete opposite way I mean, yeah. how do you feel about that the paywalls look i think it's gonna people are gonna put those up like i read the sydney morning herald online uh pretty much every day if there was a box that said okay you have to subscribe 12 dollars a month uh, I'd think about it, but I'm not necessarily sure that I couldn't get that somewhere else. So would you, would you, I mean, you're, you're not poor. So would you literally say, look, I don't want to pay $12 a month, bugger that, I'll go get it free. I mean, wouldn't you say to yourself, well, that's not much and it's a good paper and. It depends okay. on, it, it depends on that number. So okay. a lot of things, and this is, I mean, this is a, a lesson for online marketing 101 is if you can create something at a price point that the person on the other side of the screen doesn't even have to think about to click the button mm. and you can make money doing that yeah. you're you're on you're on you're winning but the perceived value of what it is is the thing like i know a friend of mine has just released a course on authority site creation and he's charging $3000 for that course now there are people who aren't they don't even question the value of that three thousand dollars. They're just putting their credit card down, stumping up, and paying him because they know him. Is that what you're going? They know. They know is. They know the value. They know he, his success record. He's showing them. He's you know. He's shown them what he's going to offer them. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's get, you know not guaranteeing them results. You can't do that for anybody. But he's he's saying, look, I'll show you exactly what I do. Now there are some people who that three thousand dollars. That's just a it's inconceivable to that person that they would not spend that money to, to find that information out. And then there's other people who say $3,000 as he lost his mind. And that person might not even spend that money if it was $199. Mm. So, you know, the value is, I don't, I look at it this way. I wouldn't go to the store every day and pay a dollar for the Sydney morning Herald. Mm. So $30 a month is probably not going to happen. 
Now, if it was ten dollars a month, I'd consider it. You know, I'd I'd start making the the value assessment. Could I go to Google News and just run a query and find what I what I want? How many articles a day do I read? And and it's it's the same for anyone who creates products or anything online. Is that you? You need to establish your value. I mean, mm. if you have a product coming out and you say you're going to charge twenty seven dollars, and nobody knows you from a bar, you know, no, nobody knows you from Job. Well, now you're dependent on other people promoting you. So that person has to use some of their, you know, bucket of goodwill uh, to promote you. And then you're expecting that person's audience to make the leap with them. Mm. And then what happens if that product that you position out there isn't isn't what that person was anticipating? Mm. Now the person who promoted you, they've lost goodwill with their audience. So, um, you know, product creation and pricing is a really tough thing. If you can make, and, and this is where I think the WSO crowd have done well for themselves, is there's people out there creating seven and nine dollar products that are worth more than that. I don't care what anyone says; they're worth a lot more than that. But they've positioned it and put it at a price point where people don't even think about it. A no-brainer price. It's so low that they're not even going to complain if it's rubbish. Right. And and yes, they could maximize their earnings, but they've built a successful little transactional business. Now, how long that can last into the future and what you do with it and that sort of stuff. But for somebody starting out, if you don't have a reputation and you don't have the luxury of other people um, giving you referral goodwill, then you have to come at that with a different angle. You you either have to establish your credibility and establish your authority some way and, and build an audience or yeah. or you have to make it so so ridiculously low priced and high value that people don't question it. And this is where podcasting comes in. Podcasting allows you to build an audience and build credibility. Right. So that's good for me. <laughs> yeah. Well no it is absolutely like it's a it is a great approach. You could write blog posts till the end of time and people can read them but they don't know your voice yeah they may they may see how you write and understand your style but they don't know your voice and all you have to do is one podcast i always look at one podcast one good interview is worth a hundred amazing blog posts right because if if one person listens to you do a good interview um they remember it yeah, it's memorable for them. Yep. And they know your name and, and yep. you, it's a, you know, it's just a, appealing to more higher level senses. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the visual thing is important. But of course, a lot of bloggers don't use their real photos and they've got pen names like doggy cat or whatever. You know? um, but their content is brilliant. You know, their following is strong. But they're not in business. But I think what I think right. what you're trying to well, I, I think what I say anyway, I can't speak for you, is that if they were to say try podcasting or start putting their real face and building that authority, it would skyrocket. Like they could build on that thing. Yeah, absolutely. But it's also a matter of is that person in business? What are they what are they there for? Is this a hobby? Is this an interest? Yeah, but see they're in denial because they put Google AdWords up and they go, oh, I'm not no. trying to make money. Well then why well, is Google AdWords up? Oh, because uh, everyone told me to do it. Google AdWords, Google AdWords is the worst monetization strategy on the go. Yes, but it's the easiest. Well, put it put it this way, right? Yeah. As a content creator, what are you trying to do? You're trying to attract people to your site. But the, no, okay, yeah, but maybe and they then, don't think of it that way. Well, well, the, here's here's how they should think of it. I'm I'm trying to attract people to my message. I'm creating all this good content. And I'm putting myself out there, and I'm doing the work, and I'm posting it. Now, in an effort to monetize, and I'll use monetize in inverted quotes, in an effort to monetize, I'm putting up ads where. I'm not getting a high volume of traffic, so I'm not going to get really great high value conversions. I'm going to get three, six, seven cents for somebody to just leave my site. So I do all this work to attract you, and then for five cents, I let you go? Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's ironic, isn't it, when you think about it, actually? Well, you may as well just, you know, you'd be much better off uh, creating a 
a five, literally, you'd be much better off spending a half a day or a day creating a 20 page ebook on how you on your own publishing process, yeah. putting a banner ad in there and selling it for one dollar. Yes, that's a really good point. Just one dollar, yeah. Because you're never gonna make you're never gonna make a dollar on AdSense. You're never it's never gonna happen. You're, you're... <laughs> well, you know, I I know some bloggers that have got really quite high level blogs, if you want to call it that, and the only advertising they do is Google AdSense, and they're really disappointed. They really wow. just can't believe that it doesn't make much because it's all traffic based. All right, we all yeah. understand that. Yeah, and it, you know, I think traffic is a bit of a misunderstood commodity. Like what people understand is original. What are they called? Page views, and then fresh page views repeat it's very it's very confusing and people you know they're just looking at the bottom line and not really understanding the process so well you have to understand what your metrics are right like i yeah. think there's that i had somebody say to me in a discussion the other day it's if you can't if you can't measure it you can't manage it well yes but you can measure the wrong thing and then mismanage stuff and page views and are the number one most mismanaged number on the internet right yeah. um it, it's it's just uh hits it's the you know it, it, same thing with hits you know who cares it's not it's not relevant your the metric you need to be measuring is uh what's your opt-in rate so sorry what's your, your opt-in rate? is that what yeah so so of the number of unique visitors who come to your site uh what percentage fill in your opt-in form yeah and, you know, the other thing is people need to be clear. Like if you're in the business of making money, one of the things you need to be a little bit clear about is the number of calls to action you have. So you'll often see web pages where uh, there'll be stuff all over the top half of the page, you know, above the fold. And, and, and you sort of say, well, what are you trying to get people to do? Um, one of the things that, you know, we sort of focus on is content should be front and center. Because that's what we want people to click on. And the other thing that should be front and center is an opt-in box. Yeah, yeah. And then if we can also manage to fit in there uh, some social media links where they, they can subscribe to our pages, to our channels or, or whatever, that's another one. So there's sort of this three levels of three levels of, of, of calls to action on a page. And, and uh, you know, and, but, but if you're trying to sell something, there was a, a post on fast web formula this morning from one of the users saying some advice I'd given him about simplifying what he was doing. Like if you're trying to sell something on a page, don't have an opt-in box because that's something that somebody else can do on that page that isn't buying. And if that page is there to sell something, sell something, put a button there that says buy now. And everything else should be secondary. And I think it's just little things that, you know. I would never have thought of that. Well, anytime you can let somebody click on something that isn't the primary focus of what that page is about, they will. If you lose 10%. But then, but then you've got to get rid of, then to me, you're saying get rid of all your social media buttons too. Well, it depends on what you're talking about, right? If, um, if you're talking about a sales page, right? If you used Optimize Press, I use it. Okay, so Optimize Press is a classy example, right? James Dyson, very clever guy. There's two types of pages. There's squeeze pages and sales pages. Gotcha. And on a sales page, what do you get? You get no sidebars. You get a video or some sales text and a button that pops up. Buy, yeah. buy now. If you want to get people to opt in, there's a video, some text, and an opt-in box. Opt in here. Mm. That's it. It's simple, right? It, the, it it focuses people's attention. Now, on a blog or or whatever, it's a it's obviously a little bit different because it is different. I was going to say it's, it's not really. Rough, it's yeah. not quite the same, but you do have to think like that because, you know, if you go back ten years ago and you start looking at some of the earliest blogs, there were stat counters, there were uh, spinning things, there was stuff happening all over the place, and what ended up happening is when you attract people's eye to something that isn't the core of what you're doing well they get distracted. and they'll go do stuff and yes, your goal yes. is to drive people to your content not away so that's why i said you know we have an opt-in box because that lets us if they actually do leave the page to fill in the opt-in box we can pull them back again with an email uh the social media buttons are there because if they click on those they're going to subscribe to our facebook pages our youtube channels our itunes feed or whatever and we can pull them back to our content 
But, you know, uh, unless somebody's paying you to put an ad up there, and I mean paying you real dollars, not, well, hopefully if people click money, you'll get money. Like, I mean, if you're selling it as a media buy, then that's a different thing. Um, but other than that, you shouldn't be distracting people with things that can take them away from your site. It's just not. So I really just want to touch on a couple of quick things because mm. we're getting short of time. Sure. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. Darren Rouse said that uh, from his marketing perspective, he put up the pie chart at ProBlogger, like what portion to what to his income. Yep. We'll call it income, yep. revenue, whatever you call it. I think it was like 90% was as a result of emails. Oh, yeah. So blog posting, um, uh, you know, re- advertising Facebook was all little tiny drops and then there was this major part of the pie that was from emails. In other words, if they emailed out an offer, that's where they got their sales from. So that tells me email list is where the money is, which is fine. Everybody says that. The money's in the list. We all know that a lot of bloggers are reluctant to even have signing boxes. If they do, it's like feed burner, which is really annoying. But anyway, we understand that's just because they don't understand. But let's say they get this list. Let's say they get their head around it and they start to get people to opt in. What would you suggest to them that they do with this list? Because predominantly they're content creators, they're original, they're not spinning PLR, they're not really out to push products. I mean, hopefully eventually they do enhance that for their listeners or readers. But what would you suggest? Would you be suggesting an autoresponder? Would you be suggesting they just get shouts of when new blog posts go up? What would so, you be suggesting they do with this newsletter so list? So the first thing is I I hate autoresponders. So I, oh. I hate the idea that somebody – uh, signs up to my list and on day three they get this on day eight they get they just get peppered with offers or something it's a bit no but that's I just think it's a bit impersonal yeah, um, okay fair enough and so the first thing is is just pick you up on a point is the relation the, the money's not in the list the money's in the relationship you have with your list right so you could have a hundred thousand person list and if nobody opens the email it doesn't matter right so right. the first thing um anybody out there who's interested in becoming uh, a marketer right i suggest you go out and you look at you know some things from people like dan kennedy uh you know th- where they tell you about you know, direct mail, because the guys doing direct mail have been doing this for a century. And what these guys, you know, you have to uh, send something to somebody, that person has to be willing to pick that thing up. So their email, they have to be willing to accept your email, they have to be willing to see that it's from you and open it. So the subject line and everything has to be compelling, and then they have to be willing to read it. So you actually have to get them into it. So having a list in and of itself doesn't help you. You have to have Mm -hmm. built up enough of a relationship where when that person sees an email coming from you, Mm -hmm. inherently in the back of their mind, they think, well, there's value here for me. Mm -hmm. Or your subject line is so good and so compelling, but that's like a one trick pony, right? You can only do that so often. If you've built up, why Darren is successful with his email is because Darren's built up a a huge reputation and a huge following of people where when they see an email come from him, they anticipate value. So, you know, he can put whatever he wants in the subject line and he's going to get a pretty high click-through rate on his emails. So then what you do, the next stage is the text of the email, there's two types. You can use your email to educate people, right? Like um, the best. But you're doing that on your blog anyway. That's what but, I'm saying. A, yeah, but, a, a blog owner is supposed to be running yeah, these two things separately. But it's also, or, but I think you, you have to think um, in a multi sort of, I hate the multi-dimensional way. A blog is just one medium to communicate with a potential customer. You can communicate with them via video. What's to stop you from sending that person a letter in the mail, right? Like you're not the the, the classic one is, you know, I'm an internet marketer. Well, there's no such thing as a yellow pages marketer. Like you're there to market to a, an audience. So don't limit yourself to just one type of thing. Like you might be a podcaster, but there's nothing that stops you from sending that person really engaging emails. Like we do webcasts for our list uh, or sorry, uh, like uh, webinars where there is no pitch at the end. There's nothing. It's come to this webinar and we will teach you X and then we'll right. po- like a mini tutorial. Yeah. But uh, look, uh, sorry, can sure. I interrupt? I, I think it's spot on. I, I 
I'm a perfect example. I'm really skeptical of people when I opt into a list. I'm like, if you bombard me with anything trashy, I'm off, right? I get really, I'm probably not a good person, but uh, there's one lady in particular on her list, and every second email is freebies. Yeah. And I'm just like, I can't wait for her but, email. What is she going to send me this but time? That's you know? awesome. There's a couple of issues is you, um, I, I, I just firmly believe that if you have a list, you occasionally have to pitch to it. Um, yes, I agree, but not no, every second. But if you keep giving people stuff for free, um, they yeah. become attached yeah. to free. So oh, you can, okay. See, I didn't see it You that can way. train people to think of you as the person who gives them stuff. And oh. then when you approach them about buying something, they'll stand back and say, but this is the person who gives me free. So they are attaching no value to what you're offering because you're giving it to them for nothing most of the time, right? So, I don't agree yeah. with this. Uh, pro blogger was saying, not not Darren was mm. himself. Someone else was saying this at his event. If you like, if you give an ebook away yeah. free for signing in, opting yeah. in, they will expect all your ebooks to be free. Yeah, absolutely, it's true. And but I, I think that depends on the demographic. So statistically, there's uh, it, it bears itself out that if you build a list of freebie seekers, your list will convert at a much lower rate for paid offers because it's people who only opted in yeah. for free stuff and they get enough offers of free stuff that they don't really need to pay for stuff anyway. So you, you'll eventually, you might hook a person who, yes, they took the free offer and then, you know, um, they will move on to something else, but you're starting to see more and more where people ref they're referred to as a lot of things. One of them is self liquidating offers where I'll make, I'll make you an offer in the first email. So like, say if I buy a solo ad or something, right? Well, the solo ad will take you to a page with like maybe a $5 offer or a $7 offer. And, and my goal isn't to build my list. My goal is to build customers. And so if I can get you to, if I can send out 300 solos and get, you know, for three hundred dollars, and get ten people to buy at thirty dollars, and that that's paid for itself. Now I have ten new customers who are more likely to buy in the future. And Darren Ray or Darren Rouse actually uh, made this comment a few years back: is if you have to earn a hundred thousand dollars a year to survive, how, how many twenty dollar ebooks do you have to sell? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm getting your point now. <laughs> 